Okay, first of all... Comrade Dines has been increasingly active on Twitter as of late, a development I first noticed when she took to berating me over matters unrelated to the video she was responding to. Predictably, this new level of availability has left her prone to comments of all sorts from supporters and detractors alike. Into the fray of sudden dialogue, Gail attempted to interject a scholarly meta-analysis with a line in the Sand Declaration, quote, For those who want empirical research on the effects of porn rather than speculation, read this meta-study, close quote. Well, okay. The study, titled The Impact of Internet Pornography on Adolescence, a review of the research and linked below, seeks to form a larger picture of the conclusions that can be drawn from the existing body of knowledge on the effects of pornography on teenagers, as well as identify the areas that demand further development. It is ironic, as we shall see, that Gail would throw down this gauntlet in response to supposed speculation, because speculation is the only thing that could be reasonably gleaned from this study. Despite a small handful of structural flaws, such as referring to spiritual development, despite the fact that the spirit's existence cannot be proven and is therefore impossible to quantify, the study is a proper scholarly analysis, and for that reason it is unsurprising that Gale and Associates are not cited or otherwise mentioned throughout. This is also refreshing because it avoids the circular citations found in such propaganda studies, i.e. Gail Dine cites Anna Bridges, who cites Bob Jensen, who cites Gail Dines, and focuses on the actual research and actual data. The study acknowledges certain difficulties out front, namely that it is impossible to monitor the direct effect of pornography on the teenage brain because it is illegal to give pornography to minors. Thus, the authors of this meta-analysis admit that they are left to compile their findings by proxy and look at reported corollaries between teens that use pornography and their various behaviors. Additionally, the authors point out that their specific tactic is to apply research on pornography in other media to pornography on the internet on the assumption that the internet will mirror or amplify these findings. So, certain correlations are discussed, but that they suggest a negative impact depends on one's views on society. That teens may develop unrealistic attitudes towards sex, that they may develop more liberal, permissive, and experimental attitudes towards sex, that they may experiment with sex at an earlier teenage year, etc. Effects such as these are only negative in the light of the society one considers ideal. If you are like me and think that trying to pull apart the two strongest magnets in all of human existence is an ultimately futile endeavor, such findings indicate that teenagers need to be taught about safe sex practices at an earlier age and then left to develop and experiment in a morally neutral environment, thus abandoning the puritanical masochism that has racked the human race with guilt for thousands of years. If, on the other hand, you are the sort that still harbors some primitive notion of puritanical values, then then yes, this may be upsetting to you. I want to break from the script for a moment to emphasize that I'm going to uh, later on be talking about a young man who uh, sexually transgressed against his younger sister, his preteen sister. So I want to emphasize again here that when I talk about teenagers experimenting sexually, I'm talking about with other teenagers. Anyway, moving forward. The study argues that teens who watch pornography may develop unrealistic attitudes about sex. This is certainly plausible, but it's akin to saying that watching science fiction gives teens an unrealistic view about space travel, or watching James Bond movies gives them unrealistic attitudes about government intelligence work. Furthermore, the study doesn't do anything to explain what these unrealistic attitudes are, short of vague terms about higher levels of permissive sexual attitudes, sexual preoccupation, and earlier sexual experimentation, as well as certain issues pertaining to perceptions of inadequate body image. To the former, one is again forced to point out that these are only problems depending on the values of the persons responsible for the teens in question. As to the body image issue, this may be upsetting, but that doesn't mean it's irrational. Young men and women may not be attractive, and rather than trying to blame the rest of the world for not pretending that Scarlett Johansson and Susan Boyle are equally pretty, it's far healthier to let those teens come to terms with 
with their actual body image. After all, what's more unrealistic to think that one's own self might not be as attractive as the women in porn, or to think that the two aforementioned women are actually, literally, and objectively equally as attractive, and that our inability to see this is the result of a widespread propaganda campaign a la Susan Faludi's backlash. There are some tough realities in the world that kids have to learn growing up. The boy whose genetics will not allow him to grow above 4 foot 8 will not be able to play football. The girl who is obese with bad skin and disproportionate features is unlikely to be picked for homecoming queen. Rather than trying to create some delusional social upheaval over beauty standards, these students will be better served by being taught to develop their skills in other areas and to predicate their self-esteem on those achievements. To the matter of viewing pornography causing sexual aggression, the researchers turn to the findings of Neil Malamuth and his colleagues who argue that viewing pornography does not cause a healthy person to act out violently, but rather can be a catalyst for people who have pre-existing dispositions towards violent aggressive behavior. In other words, the causal relationship that Gale suggests is not indicated in the study, and this is a critical factor in understanding what the study is actually saying. This meta-analysis is careful to indicate correlation between porn use and negative behaviors in all cases, but this does not mean causation. After all, what is more realistic, that a youth becomes preoccupied with sex after viewing pornography, or views pornography because he is already preoccupied with sex? This is critical. Gale said that this study would demonstrate the effects of viewing pornography, yet the study is careful not to declare a causal relationship in any form. At most, we could say that these findings might imply a causal relationship, but the researchers themselves are careful not to even do that. The final amalgamation of studies is in regard to the issue of pornography as it relates to the brains of adolescents. It begins with an upfront declaration that... Studies examining the impact of pornography consumption in the cortical substrates in the brains of healthy control adolescent subjects are non-existent at this time, and then proceeds to outline various elements of the existing body of knowledge that make a compelling case for future research. It then goes on to point out certain possible factors such as poor impulse control and risk assessment problems in adolescents who are mentally deficient or suffering from some delayed maturation of their cognitive faculties. Again, this points to pre-existing problems, not problems with the pornography itself. Nevertheless, the study does go on to indicate that the body of knowledge in this area is also incomplete and points to research that argues adolescents in general are capable of reasoning and risk evaluation. Additional avenues such as uh, preferential treatment of pornography images by the encoding mechanisms of the brain are suggested and explored, but all of these come with a strong caveat that this only demonstrates the need for further research, not conclusive results. The next section is on future research and begins with, although the literature does indicate inquiry into issues of internet pornography use among adolescents, the research is sparse and leaves more questions than answers, close quote. The rest of the section follows suit, outlining the types of inquiry needed, as well as inquiry into the appropriate methods for the process of conducting research. I would encourage anyone who is skeptical of my findings to examine the study for themselves, but the conclusion outlines all of these shortcomings well, and I will read it in its entirety. Increased access to the Internet by adolescents has created unprecedented opportunities for sexual education, learning, and growth. Conversely, the risk of harm that is evident in the literature has led researchers to investigate adolescent exposure to online pornography in an effort to elucidate these relationships. Collectively, these studies suggest that youth who consume pornography may develop unrealistic sexual values and beliefs. Among the findings, higher levels of permissive sexual attitudes sexual preoccupation and earlier sexual experimentation have been correlated with more frequent consumption of pornography. Researchers have had difficulty replicating these results, however, and as a result, the aggregate literature has failed to indicate conclusive results. Nevertheless, consistent findings have emerged linking adolescent use of pornography that 
depicts violence with increased degrees of sexually aggressive behavior. The literature does indicate some correlation between adolescents' use of pornography and self-concept. Girls report feeling inferior to the women they view in pornographic material, while boys fear they may not be as virile or able to perform as the men in these media. Adolescents also report that their use of pornography decreased as their self-confidence and social development increased. Additionally, research suggests that adolescents who use pornography, especially that found on the internet, have lower degrees of social integration, increases in conduct problems, higher levels of delinquent behavior, higher in incidence of depressive symptoms, and decreased emotional bonding with caregivers. Research in the domain of neuroimaging, neurosciences, and neuropsychology can only offer speculation regarding the impact of adolescent use of pornography at this time. However, based on hypotheses deduced from other populations, pornography use among vulnerable groups appears to be contraindicated. The long-term impact of these effects and trends requires further investigation. Given that children and adolescents are widely considered the most vulnerable audiences to sexually explicit material and that the rate, manner, and type of exposure is categorically different from that of pre-internet generations, it is certain to be relevant uh, it is certain to be a relevant area of study for some time. The effects of internet pornography use might better be described through pertinent, vigorous research. Such research will assist parents, educators, policymakers, health professionals, and law enforcement in fostering and supporting the healthy development of youth while minimizing the risk potential for negative effects related to internet pornography. I asked Gail what she thought this study was supposed to prove. I asked three times in direct messages on Twitter. She has yet to respond, and I'm not holding my breath. Gail posted the study in response to her critics' arguments, which she dismissed as speculation. Yet speculation is the only thing that this study offers, albeit informed speculation. One study chronicled even suggests that teens are able to distinguish between the fantasy sex of porn and the reality of sex as it's commonly practiced. How does one glean anything definite about the effects of pornography from this? How can it be a refutation to speculation when it describes its own findings as speculative? In the interest of refuting her critics, Dines has offered a study whose only conclusion is that more research and better research methods are needed. It presents no definite findings and makes repeated efforts to emphasize that these findings only indicate correlation, not causality. What little research into causality there is indicates that problematic porn viewing is based on pre-existing conditions, not the porn viewing in and of itself, though even this is only indicated to be more likely, not conclusive. As I read this document, I found myself trying to imagine what cognition was occurring in Gail's mind when she herself read this. How was she coming to the conclusion that this meta-analysis supported her worldview that pornography is a public health emergency being foisted upon the world by greedy capitalists. To read this document and come to that conclusion is to study U.S. history and declare that Abraham Lincoln shot John Wilkes Booth. So how could Gale read this study and conclude that it supported her argument? The answer may lie in the landmark feminist screed known as the Wellesley Report, or under its published name, How Schools Shortchange Girls. One of the report's authors, Peggy McIntosh, argues that while men are vertical thinkers, meaning that they view the world in terms of right and wrong and win and lose, where uh, women, on the other hand, are lateral thinkers. Lateral thinking is a feminine form of reasoning based on emotions and impressionistic feelings. In her fall 1990 teacher's workshop in Brookline, Massachusetts, McIntosh exemplified the problem of vertical learning by talking about a young girl who had trouble adding 1 plus 3 plus 5. The problem in McIntosh's mind was not the young girl's difficulty, but rather the nature of the problem, that it forced her to think vertically vertically and thus undermined her self-esteem. McIntosh then urged teachers to think of lateral teaching methods that took students off the right-wrong win-lose axis. But what were those methods? Blank out. McIntosh defines the aim of lateral thinking as not to win, but to be in a decent relationship with the invisible elements of the universe.
What does this do for the little girl who is having trouble with addition? Blank out. Similarly, feminist theorist Elizabeth Fee declares, quote, Knowledge was created as an act of aggression. A passive nature had to be interrogated, unclothed, penetrated, and compelled by man to reveal her secrets, close quote. This view is echoed by other prominent feminists, such as Sandra Harding, Mary Ellman, and Catherine McKinnon, who have declared that to know also carries the biblical meaning to have sexual intercourse, and therefore men acquiring knowledge is a form of rape. Yes, you heard that right. Ellman and McKinnon claim that men approach nature as rapists approach a woman, taking joy in violating her, in penetrating her secrets, and, as McKinnon puts it, for men, to know has meant to fuck. Sandra Harding is similarly minded, arguing that Newton's principles of mechanics could just as aptly be titled Newton's Rape Manual. The absurdity of this notion that the absurdity of the notion that the pursuit of knowledge is a form of rape, aside from being a heinous smack in the face to actual rape victims, should be readily apparent, but just to explain, let's consider the implications. If a rape victim files a report at her local rape crisis center and is asked to give an account of what happened, is her knowing that she was raped itself a form of rape? Indeed, her understanding of the events are a result of her combining the information provided by her senses with the pre-existing knowledge that she did not want to have sex with this person, so should her claim be thrown out on the basis of vertical thinking? By extension, what's the point of having police and a court system to conduct a thorough investigation of the events of a crime and attempt to arrive at the objective truth from which justice is to be determined. Do you feel like your house was robbed? You need not provide any evidence of forcible entry or that anything was stolen. You simply have to know that your feelings about being robbed are in harmony with the universe. Do you believe that your neighbor down the street was the one who robbed you? You don't need to provide any evidence, nor does law enforcement. Your feelings that he was the culprit are proof enough. Years ago, I was, embarrassingly, heavily involved in occult religious practices of various disciplines. I used to attend mass at a particular organization, and one day the head of the group took me aside and told me that I had done various things that had angered at least six members of the group. I asked what I had done to wrong them, as I was not aware of any of these problems, and he told me that he wasn't going to tell me just so I could keep making excuses, that I needed to accept that I had done wrong and ask for forgiveness. Not from those people, mind you, but from him. In fact, he expressly forbade me to talk to anyone in the group about what I'd supposedly done. The only incident he would point to involved a conflict I'd had with someone who wasn't a member of the group, and he was incensed when I dealt with that conflict directly rather than getting his approval. He explained to me that while I may not have done anything wrong in my reality, other people may perceive me as having done something wrong in their reality, and that I needed to take responsibility for that. It was at that point that I abandoned the occult and all religious practices altogether. The aforementioned analogy of a courtroom where people could be found guilty on the basis of feelings flashed through my mind then as well. As I contemplated my expulsion from the group, I thought of an old idea I'd heard passed around among members, uh, which was, if two people are sitting on opposite ends of a table looking at a lobster dinner in the middle, they are arguably seeing two different lobsters, because each could see facets of the lobster that the other could not. I thought to myself, well, if they think they can see two different lobsters, let them try eating two different lobsters. As a side note, I found out about a year and a half later from now former members of the group that disgust over my expulsion had actually led to a mass exodus of persons leaving the organization. As it turned out, there actually was no problem with me amongst the members, and my expulsion had more to do with the fact that I wasn't tithing. This parallel should serve to further demonstrate that feminism, at least gender feminism, is not a social science but a religion. But more importantly, it should serve to sharply underscore the manner in which Dines and Company not only work against academic credibility but also work against the basic laws of logic and reality. Many of you have wished that I wouldn't bring up Ayn Rand, but but before being an advocate of capitalism, she is first and foremost an advocate of reason. Consider then this quote from the John Galt speech. 
your teachers have reversed causality in their consciousness, then strive to reverse it in existence. They take their emotions as a cause and their mind as a passive effect. They make their emotions their tool for perceiving reality. They hold their desires as an irreducible primary, as a fact superseding all facts. Does that not sound like the mindset of Comrade Dines and her fellow mental masturbators of lateral thinking? Reality does not respond to lateral thinking. It demands on penalty of death that all rational beings use what feminists would decry as vertical thinking based on judgments of right and wrong. Will protease inhibitors block the developmental progress of HIV, right or wrong? Will extreme heat sterilize medical equipment, right or wrong? Can radio waves be harnessed to transmit information, right or wrong? Can the combustion engine work in concert with the laws of physics to keep a plane in the air, right or wrong? Do you have to eat to live, right or wrong? If primitive humans had abandoned their burgeoning capacity for reason in favor of lateral thinking, the entire species would have been wiped out by the bloodthirsty beasts of the wilderness while they set about feeling in harmony with existence. It is only so-called vertical thinking that has made the world of today possible, and it is only vertical thinking that can maintain our standard of living. And who is responsible for this vertical thinking? Consider again this quote from John Galt. Who pays for the orgy? Who causes the causeless? Who are the victims, condemned to remain unacknowledged and perish in silence, lest their agony disturb your pretense that they do not exist? We are, we, the men of the mind. We are the cause of all the values that you covet. We who perform the process of thinking, which is the process of defining identity and discovering causal connections. We taught you to know, to speak, to produce, to desire, to love. You who abandon reason, were it not for us who preserve it, you would not be able to fulfill or even conceive your wishes. You who leap like a savage out of the jungle of your feelings and into the Fifth Avenue of our New York and proclaim that you want to keep the electric lights but destroy the generators, it is our wealth that you use while destroying us. It is our values that you use while damning us. It is our language that you use while denying the mind. When Ayn Rand wrote the word men in that passage, she intended for it to refer to all humanity, male or female, but ironically, the gender feminists have unwittingly made it literal. They propose a world where men perform vertical thinking, which is actually just thinking, while women are to perform lateral thinking, which is actually just feeling. How does a study that says the opposite of what Gail Dines claims it does actually support her worldview? Well, through lateral thinking, which reveals a truth that is somehow imperceptible to the male mind, the study simply does. Set free of the constraints of a causal reality, anything can mean anything. In her seminal work, Who Stole Feminism?, Christina Hoff Summers refers to attempts on the part of feminists to rewrite school history books to reflect feminist beliefs about history, such as the idea that Native American tribes were matriarchal, for example, stating that some tribes would have the wives of the tribal leaders stand over them while they discussed policy and shout orders to them about what decisions to make. The fact that this is complete fiction is irrelevant to feminists. They were too busy standing over the textbook authors and shouting orders to them to care. So we see it going as the underlying truth of feminist doctrine, that women will rule the rationality of masculinity with the feelings of femininity, that man's mind is the ox that pulls the cart of women's intuition. This subjugation of intellectual truth to emotional whim is inherent in the collectivist mindset from which gender feminism is derived, that the needs of the collective serve as a claim ticket on the mind of the individual. But even more so, this feminist mindset is a profound insult to the many millions of women who are perfectly capable of vertical thinking and who would be profoundly insulted to hear that they are emotional creatures who need to bask in their feelings while the men do all the work. And in a twist of mind-numbing irony, is that not one of the very stereotypes that feminism was intended to oppose? The idea that women are emotional creatures that aren't capable of reason? Time and again, feminism seeks not to oppose the degrading stereotypes of womanhood, but rather to champion them as a higher mode of life, and for that reason, there are few things more misogynistic than feminism. 
For a more immediate application of this bizarre mode of thought, consider Stop Porn Culture's recent commentary on the news of a 13-year-old boy from Blackwater, UK, who pled guilty to raping his 8-year-old sister. The full story in the Daily Mail tells of a boy who decided to try having sex with his sister because she was, quote, small and couldn't remember stuff. SPC's hack write-up of the situation conveniently avoids this fact. Instead, they jump to declaring that the age of first viewing pornography is 11, which is incorrect. The statistic was made up by Mark Castleman, a fact that was spoken aloud to a round of applause by Jesse Fisher at the Cambridge porn debate while Gail Dines herself sat only a few feet away. Why does Gail continue to publish as true something that is not at all true, or in layman's terms, lie? Well, by the magic of lateral thinking, anything is possible. Dines and company are, predictably, happy to shift blame away from the boy and the negligent parents and declare that the boy and the girl are both victims of the porn industry. By shifting the blame away from the actual perpetrators and onto the industry that is, in fact, morally neutral in this matter, Gail throws the little girl under the bus and only a short while after she chastised me for using using her former protege's suicide to promote myself as an author. How did I promote myself as an author when I never once mentioned my creative work in Beth's obituary video? Through the lateral magic of laterally positive lateral thinking. But more heinous than Gail's revolting egalitarian posturing is that her propaganda as academia garbage may actually serve to stand in the way of the solution. This boy is not a victim. He's showing the early signs of pedophilia, the onset of which begins with puberty. Sexual predators select victims that they know will be defenseless and easily manipulated, and by his own confession, that's exactly what this boy did. The other boy mentioned later in the article who also victimized his uh, own sister shows the same symptoms. And to that second case, what gross negligence of parenting is necessary for a brother to successfully rape his sister repeatedly over the course of a year without any knowledge from his parents? There have also been at least two instances where older brothers have killed their little sisters while emulating professional wrestling. One of those cases, that of Lionel Tate, resulted in the youngest U.S. citizen ever sentenced to life imprisonment, though this was later commuted on appeal. Unsurprisingly, Tate has subsequently been convicted on multiple counts, including probation violation and armed robbery, which suggests that he has deeper problems than simply emulating what he saw in professional wrestling. Nevertheless, pro wrestling continues to air to this day, just like football, boxing, and any number of other violent sports that, given their cultural acceptance few people seem to worry about kids emulating. Hell, realtors are even allowed to sell junior-sized sports gear to facilitate kids emulating these activities, and all of this goes on with minimal opposition, if any, for no other reason than the widespread social acceptance of these practices. I'm not in favor of censoring sports or pornography. Quite the opposite. If you insist on what Comrade Dines so callously calls a legislative approach, then ratchet up the punishment for the kids and parents of kids who actually perpetrate violent acts against others. Leave the rest of us alone to enjoy our entertainment and the peace and civility of our own homes, rather than declaring that we need our rights and freedoms stripped for the benefit of thuggish children. But ultimately, I'm not even in favor of increasing those punishments either. Despite Comrade Dine's vacant decrees that we are experiencing a public health emergency, we aren't seeing piles of brutally murdered, semen-filled little sisters in the streets. What we are seeing is deviant behavior from a tiny fraction of the human race that is infinitesimal when compared to the sheer number of people who don't behave this way. I would look up some exact figures, but I think presenting them to laterally thinking gender feminists would just be pissing in the wind. If you're coming to youtube.com slash jordanowen42 for the first time, I invite you to subscribe for future videos, pick up a copy of my novel Eros Empire, available wherever fine books are sold, and check out my exciting new science fiction fantasy web series, The Vessel Chronicles. Thank you for your time.